Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you to our volunteer meeting today. We have Sofia Ibarra from the Kinship um, Department of the Department of Family Protective Services, and she's going to be talking to us about kinship. Um, if you are live with us here as a CASA volunteer for Claiborne County and the Brush Country CASA area, I will be putting this in Optima for you. If you're watching this um, recording, then please make sure that you enter in Optima so that you can receive credit. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sophia. And just to point out, she's having a little bit of issue with her camera, so we're going to leave it off, but it's okay. The content is still so valuable. So we're happy to have you, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to throw a lot of information out, but if you guys have questions, that's totally fine. So um, with kinship, we'll start with that pretty much, especially with families. In order for them to qualify for kinship funds is what we call it, where they get um, like a monthly income uh, every month. They have to have a favorable home study. So if their home study does not pass, uh, they don't qualify. That means that the department has concerns that cannot be fixed, such as a CPS uh, background, issues with the criminal history that we have concerns about. Um, that is, that's one of them. The other thing is income. And we put in the numbers and the computer tells us whether you qualify or not, depending on the household income and how many members are in your home, the caregiver's home. Uh, if it exceeds, they're not gonna be able to get some sort of reimbursement funding uh, monthly for the children. Now, the funding is only good for a year. Like, that's it. However, fast forward, if we have a goal that is adoption, and let's say the caregivers are trying to be licensed to adopt, then we can extend those funds for only up to six months. Or if a parent uh, appeals a termination, uh, we know that takes a long time, we can extend those benefits. Um, so, so that's the kinship side of it. Is there any questions with that? I have questions. So the kinship funding is available for folks who are taking these children in and do they have to, they're, they're going to be kinship, correct? Like they're next of kin or like family members. Correct. Can it be fictive kin as well? Yes. Okay. And then, um, so they're applying for funding and then depending on the, the qualities that you mentioned before or the criteria, that's how you determine how much funding they're eligible for. Yes. Okay, I'm just making sure I'm following. You're good, you're good. Um, uh, question. Yes. Uh, I don't know if this is included in home, home studies, but let's say the parents are also in the same town as the kinship and their rights are terminated. Um, how, is there any barrier on the home study for the kids to be with that fictive kin and get receiving funds if the parents are to, want to come around or because I don't know because they're still family so they still try to see their kids so uh, is but the question a, like it's more of a legal question so you're saying that if the parents rights are already terminated and they're coming around the caregiver's home right yeah after termination um I mean that's if our case is closed like, is it an open case or a closed case? Uh, I would say, well, if it's closed, it's closed. But yeah, open. So if if they're they're with fictive kin and even working on adoption or whatever, but the parents are still coming around. I don't think that's recommended because of the fact that if rights are terminated, you really don't have no rights to see those children, especially if there's a no contact order, then I mean, that right there. And here's the other thing is if the family is trying to be licensed to adopt these children, then if visitation is suspended or no visitation per court order, then why is visitation still going on? Right, right. So it would be up to the the kinship to the or the fictive can to make sure that that's not happening, right? Correct, because if we have an open case and they're trying to adopt, 
and they're going through the process, most likely the judge has already suspended visits, already court ordered like no visits. Right. Um, and that right there, they're the fictive kin or caregiver. They're in violation right there because those parents cannot be around now. Now, when we're out of the case, that is up to them. If they want to open that door, if the parent changes their lifestyle down the road or anything like that, some grandparents will do that down the road because it's their own children that got their rights terminated. Right. Um, you know, but I always caution my caregivers and fictive kin like, hey, once you open this door, there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> okay. So, okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Was there any questions uh, regarding kinship? If not, I'm going to go into the licensing part of what we do. Uh, what is the what is like what is the minimum and maximum amount of funding that can be received for kinship? Regardless of the age of the child, it's three seventy five. It has there's change in there, but it's just three seventy five per child. That's it. And it's um, a max of one year. You said yes. Okay. And it doesn't matter their mental health or anything like that because we're not a private agency. Um, it's just a one amount per child and that's it, regardless on the mental health diagnosis. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else have questions on the kinship side? Okay, so FAD is another area that we do. Um, it's work called Foster and Adoptive Development Worker. And this is where we're able to license the home. Um, so here's the thing, and I think some, even the judges and some get confused about is the FCON program that we offer, that's one program. That is both fostering and adoption. So I will use that if there's no possibility of adoption and that the parents are not going to get the kids back. So that right there, it is a federal program. So the judge cannot court order payments. Um, that is all through federal. Um, it is a lot because the family is being licensed to foster. Their home, it, it's going to be a picky home. Uh, just because they have a home, that does not really qualify them to be a foster and adoptive home. If there's a lot of work that needs to be on that home and the family is going to have to put money into it, then obviously it's not going to be best for the family um, because where are they going to get the money from? So the other thing too is that the foster adoptive, it's a lot where the family does have to pay into it, like their CPR classes. We don't pay for that, they do. Their first aid classes, they have to pay for that. Um, some FBIs, they are going to have to pay for whatever upgrades they have to do to their home. Uh, you know, pet vaccinations, that is something that they'd have to pay for. So, it, with that, even if they have all those items that were needed, and it is a lot of items, it's a, it's a page long, <laughs> um, they have to be licensed for at least six months. And then after the six months, once the judge dismisses the case, then the family can go ahead and continue to receive funding for the kids until they're 18. That means they get the Medicaid as well. Um, college tuition waiver. Now, if the judge closes the case before that six months, they're not going to get anything after the case closes. And while they're fostering, the amount is doubled. So it's like maybe 700 or something dollar per child, but it's only for those six months. And then after those six months, it goes down to uh, about $400 per child. And then that's it. So I'm going to stop right there because I know I just gave a lot of information. <laughs> okay, so you said 
let me ask this question. Whenever they're getting certified for foster and adoption and they're going through that process, is that the same process that, you know, uh, traditional foster parents would go through? Unfortunately, mostly yes. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> and then my next question is, they're only licensed for those particular children or are they licensed at this point to take on additional children? They're only licensed for those particular children in their home. Got it. And we don't do the home study on that. We have to contract that out. Uh, sometimes the deal breaker with this, with caregivers, um, is that state licensing will go to their home unannounced. They will not notify me because they know I'm probably going to notify the caregivers. Um, I don't know. I don't get notified till afterwards or when my caregivers like text me. So, and, and I get it, but you know, they just don't go one time during the six months. They can go two or three times during that six months that they're fostering and they have like, how traditional foster homes have a binder where they do have to keep, you know, everything in there. So they are treated like a foster home because they have those dual, that dual license. And not every home is going to be qualified for that. Like I'm not going to set a home up for failure. You know, I, I wouldn't do that. Um, the home needs a lot of work, and I know state licensing is going to be picky about it because they are. I'm not going to set that home up for failure because if they have issues with it, it can't be fixed, and I have to close that home, you know, with that program. And there's really nothing that I can do. And state office, even if I were to do a waiver, uh, state office, they have to approve that. And sometimes they'll deny it. Sometimes they'll approve it. Do you find that the home studies tend to take longer in this type of situation? Um, no, no. Can you give an example of a home that wouldn't qualify? So like, um, it, the FCON program, we call it the Foster Connections program. This is just one program that I'm telling you about. We only we have two. A home that wouldn't qualify for that is like, let's say they have um, a bunch of clutter in the yard, you know, that they cannot lift or get rid of. Um, you know, they're kind of elderly a little bit. The home is, you know, kind of run down where... You know, they have to put like a piece of board down on the floor and maybe tape it up with the gray tape or whatever else, you know, the whole patching and stuff like that, like homes like that, rather than, you know, a little bit more of a newer home, um, you know, wouldn't have those kind of issues or concerns. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Could yes. you repeat the money part that you said just before you open for questions, please? Uh, for the for the fostering and adoption program or for the yes. kinship? Okay, oh, kinship. So for, kinship, please. Okay, kinship. Kinship. So yes. for, for them to have a favorable home study, the kinship funds per child is 375 and some change. I don't have the exact number. And that's it. Regardless of diagnosis and age, it's just 375. Thank you. But, but it's only good for a year. <laughs> Great. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, I'm going to piggyback on that. If there's another caregiver that has received funds, um, it doesn't start all over with another caregiver. It'll, it's the same case number and everything. It's only for a year for that case number. That's it. <laughs> So sometimes okay. I think caregivers, some, very few, uh, will think of it as, well, I'll keep this child and then I can go ahead and give this child to you 
and then you can get funds too. It doesn't work like that. We're not going to move these, these kids from one caregiver to the next, to the next, to the next for monetary gain. Um, that child only has a year of kinship services under their name and that's it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions regarding the, the fostering and adoption program before I move to the next one? Okay. Um, the last program that we have, we call it a kinship adoption program. Anna does both fostering connections and the kinship adoption program uh, because of the area that she's at. Where I'm at, Rockport, Aransas, San Patricio County, um, I do a lot of kinship adoptions. Uh, we, short term kin ADO, and that's because here in this area, the judges have give the parents a year. And if the parents don't do it in the year, we're going we're going to termination. Uh, the judges in my area don't like to extend these cases. They don't like to do no two or three years. I know Nueces County does sometimes that, um, but the judges here are very uh, formal and usually at a six month mark or a little bit more, if there's not much progress that they're not looking for, we're, we're gonna go and straight into an adoption mode. Um, with that, I tend to license my homes for that as long as they have a favorable home study. Um, the other thing too is even if they're older homes, whatever else, you know, we're more lenient because we can't put in waivers um, because they're family and it's just an adoption home. Like they're not having to go through the process that a foster home would go through because they're not fostering their adoption. They don't have to do the CPR. They don't have to do the first aid and pay for all that. They don't have to do the classes in person. So, and they still, once they're licensed um, and adoption happens, they still get the subsidy of the $400 if the child meets that. Other than that, I type up my own ones. I don't contract that out. I type them up. I do my references and everything because it's just an adoption. They're easier to me. They're quicker <laughs> um, because they're ready. I'm already working with the family right when the goal changes. So do you guys have any questions on that? What did you call that one again? It's kinship adoption. Okay, thank you. And for those of you who joined us um, a little after the, the presentation began, I am recording this and I'd be happy to send it over, especially I know we have a lot of folks from Casa de Coastal Bend. I'll send it over. That way, if you missed the beginning part, you can watch it. So I guess my question for you, Sophia, is as Casa volunteers who are working this case and we're coming in sometimes at the beginning, sometimes at the middle, but our goal is always like concurrent planning, right? Of course it's family reunification, but we're also seeking other solutions. Um, should we have kinship in the back of our mind? Like when should we start talking about kinship with potential family members? So, and I tell all the workers this, once you move that child into a family home, you need to send us a referral. Um, I've had a lot of out of regions that don't send the referral, even though they know what's going to happen in the case, or if they're just going to, if they don't want the family, or if they don't want to keep the case open long enough for the family to be licensed, I still need that referral because the family could receive kinship funds, you know, even if they're not going to go through the licensing program. Um, and if they don't want to, they have the right to decline too. And if they're just like, this is too intrusive, I'm done with it, okay. Can I at least see if I can, you know, qualify you to see if you can get some sort of funding on the child since you're not getting paid any child support? Even if it's court ordered, most likely parents don't pay it. Right. <laughs> so my job, our job, the kinship side, we are for the caregivers primarily because that right there 
it's expensive. So we try our best to keep that home stable, that some sort of help is coming. Uh, we are still CPS. So if it's not in the best interest of the child, if it's not in the best interest of the caregivers and if they have other children in the home, we got to see what's best for like all the kids too. Cause the last thing we want is another referral regarding behaviors from the other kids because you know, our child is there, you know, or the caregiver, you know, is going into a depression and now is, you know, getting pills and everything. I mean, so we look at all of it. I have a question. But I will, oh, go ahead. Um, if a home study is not approved, can they receive any sort of kinship assistance? No. No. Okay. No, but I could... I mean, if they need, you know, basic needs like beds and stuff, I mean, we can help them that way. Um, if that home study is unfavorable, there's nothing on the kinship side that we can do. And because they have the concerns, I, I brought it up that, well, why are we even there if their caseworker has to see them every week because the home study is not favorable? Well, because the home study is not favorable, they're still concerned. So not only do they want the caseworker out there every week, we still have to go to the home every month because we're a second set of eyes. Okay, thank you. Um, I am mostly for the children to have permanency. Um, so if if the parents are not doing what they need to do, I do support my judges out here that then we need to go straight to termination because of the fact that the child is going to do better with stability. Um, that right there, the kinship adoption process, licensing, it's much easier on the caregivers. A lot of judges will just do, you know, PMC, which is permanent managing conservatorship. However, a few cases here and there, we're finding that, okay, down the road, these parents are coming back. And because their rights have not been terminated, they're able to still go up to the judge and be like, well, I want this extended and I want to try to get my kids back again. So then it, it throws a wrench into the case because the caregiver and the child has been established, but then, you know, here comes the parents with, you know, change of lifestyle and everything else. And then they want the kids back because now we have that open door. So rather than if their rights were to be terminated because they're not doing what they are doing, leave it up to the caregiver of what is in the best interest of the child instead of having a disruption and then going back and forth, you know, or if you want the parents to, you know, visit a child at a birthday party, invite them or whatever on holidays, that's something minimal it could be worked with rather than a whole change of environment. So I'm, I'm just big on permanency uh, just because the kids just need to be established, you know, at just one location. Question. Do, do kinship workers testify in court regarding the cases that they serve? No, we do not go to court. However, if I'm needed, I'll go. Um, all of my adoption cases, I do attend because, I mean, I've licensed the family. They're my families. But, no, unless it's needed. Okay. But it has to be a, a pretty bad case. But other than that, no, the caseworkers just take our information of what they're at, uh, what we'd offered, and things like that. Any other questions? This is a great opportunity to kind of ask all those burning questions to truly understand kinship and, and what they offer. All right, Sophia, I don't see any other questions from the volunteers at this time. Is there anything else that you'd like to add or anything that the CASAS can kind of look out for as we're working with children and families? Uh, no, just whenever, um, when the, when parental rights have been terminated, a lot of the times 
we do wait until that happens for us to do our home study and the references because if it doesn't go through, it doesn't go through. Um, so we wait because we do have to type up like 20 plus pages. Um, but also we're here till the end until adoption. So once termination happens, the family gets a new caseworker, they get an adoption worker and there's a three month period that the adoption worker has to do what they have to do for appeals and things like that. And then after the three months, um, then they can, the child can go ahead and get adopted by like the 91st day. And I know that cause I, I just came from adoptions a couple of years ago and then now I'm on the kinship side of it. So, but, um, other than that, uh, that that's it. <laughs> Wonderful. So if any of our volunteers have questions regarding kinship, can they reach out to you or like, are you specifically for Nueces County in that area? And then like, if we have questions here, like in Kingsville, we would talk to Anna. Correct. Um, so I'm not in Corpus. So if any of your CASA worker has questions for San Patricia County or Aransas County, um, those are the counties that I usually, you know, license. Anna does Kingsville and Robstown and um, some areas in Cal Allen. And then we have like maybe four or five workers that do Nueces County. Wonderful. All righty. And I do notice that we still have some folks jumping on a little bit late. I just want to reiterate that this is being recorded. So I will go ahead and send that out once we once we're completed. But um, thank you so much for being with us, Sophia. I really appreciate your time. Not a problem. Sorry about my camera. And even if um, those that came on late, if they have questions, you're more than welcome to email email them to me, or you can call me. It's not a problem, and I can answer those questions. Would you mind putting your email in the chat? Yes. That way we can grab that. Okay. And does anyone else have any questions right now, even any of the folks that just came in? We discussed um, kinship. We talked about what the criteria is in order to get funding for kinship and what that funding looks like and how long it lasts. And then we also talked about, um, let's see, I have notes. We talked about the kinship adoption program. And then we also spoke about, what am I missing here? A uh, fostering connection. So anyone have questions? All right, well then without further ado, I'll just go ahead and end this meeting here. Again, thank you so much, Sophia, for being here and I will be sending out the recording shortly. Awesome, thank you, Nicole. And I typed in my email and number. I see that. I'm gonna go ahead and write that down and everybody please have a good day. All right, thank you, Nicole. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.